on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party What's up, party people? It's Talib Kweli, the MCEO, the BKMC, the Little Lebowski Urban Achiever. This is the People's Party. We got the people. This is the party. I got my lovely and talented co-host, Jasmine Lee. Give it up for Jasmine Lee. Yeah. Oh, it's should be deep. We deep. <laughs> deep today. People came out for today's guest. Yeah. Because people want to know what this man has to say. This guest is an icon of the culture. He's like ubiquitous in just American culture. Started his career early, movies like uh, Me, Myself, and Irene. Mm. Um, he was working on the Bernie Mac show. You see him all over the Food Network. He's in one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, Malibu's Most Wanted. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Hustle and Flow, The Departed. Did I say The Departed yet? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get The Departed yet. He's straight out of Compton. He's on one of the greatest shows of all time, mm -hmm. Blackish, which has other shows that spun off Mixed Dish and Grownish. Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party welcomes Anthony Anderson. I think he's. I think he's. He's. He's going for first. <laughs> right. Yeah. We be having a. Uh, we, hold on. We be having? We be having. Oh. You own a bookstore and you, you speak right. like that? We that's, be that's, having. That's called code switching, brother. Yes, I'm it sure is. I'm sure y'all did an episode about that on Blackish. Yes, we you, have. Hey, yes, did you? I have. missed that one. I missed the code switching it's one. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> so, straight out of Compton, Born crazy race. motherfucker named Anthony. Yeah. Tell me yeah. about your journey from Compton down the street to the yeah. bright lights <laughs> of Hollywood. Ah, uh, wow. Uh... I'll start by saying this is all that I've ever wanted to do with my life. Mm. Um, three things. I wanted to play football uh, for the Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a lawyer and eventually become a judge. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be an actor. Mm -hmm. And at the age of nine, I realized that if I became an actor, I could be all three of those things and whatever else I wanted to become in life. Okay. And, you understood uh, the platform. Yeah. yeah. And and so that's that's where the journey began, man. And my mother... Uh, is a failed actress. Uh, she's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she is. But, oh I, but, I, but I love her. <laughs> I love you, mama. Man, you, you know you're bad. Um, but she I don't be in the comment section. <laughs> but I was, I was uh, my mother was doing a production of A Raisin in the Sun mm -hmm. at Compton Community College. And uh, I'm the oldest of four. Uh, but at the time, it was only uh, me and my two brothers. My, my, mm -hmm. my sister's the youngest. But at, at that time, it was only the three of us. And we were being babysat by the theater in the back of the theater. Okay. And I just happened to look up on stage and see my mother rehearsing uh, with everyone. And I said, that's what I'm going to do with the okay. rest of my mm -hmm. life. And I was nine years old. Okay. And and that's where the journey began, man. Yeah. So any opportunity that I got to be in, in front of anyone, a uh, captive audience, be it singing in church on Sunday, be it a spelling, be it school, be it, mm -hmm. you know, thank you, thank you. when the teacher asked anybody who wants to read out loud, mm -hmm. I, I always rose my hand and mm -hmm. rose my hand, raised my hand, and uh, I was the first to volunteer anytime that I could perform in front of an audience. Right. Mm -hmm. It was like a, an addiction, an adrenaline rush. An adrenaline rush, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I realized at an, at an early age that this was what my energy was created and put on this earth to do, mm -hmm. uh, to entertain and to have an effect and an effect on people's lives with, with my work. And I don't say I have a talent. I have a gift. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've been blessed with a gift and right. it's my responsibility to share this gift with the world that I've been blessed with. Understood. Understood. Yeah. I'm always fascinated with people who grow up in Los Angeles County and in Compton and places like that. Mm -hmm. So adjacent to Hollywood because me coming from the East coast, you know, LA Hollywood seems so far away. Oh yeah. The bright lights seem so far away. And it's, it's like, you know, when I did spend some time living in Los Angeles, I noticed that it felt like, especially being in the entertainment industry, if you weren't on a billboard, mm -hmm. you weren't cracking. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Do you feel like there's any pressure on entertainers who grow up here in this, in this space, or like more of a pressure from people who, who might come here on a bus? No, man. You, you know, what's crazy. You know, when people earlier on in my career or whenever when people find out that I'm from L.A., they were like, what? 
Mm. Right, because no you one's know, from here. No, no one's from here, right. and you're in this industry that mm. that's here. But it, but everybody is coming here for mm. that. And and when they find out, no, I'm born and raised right down the street in Compton. This mm-hmm. this was it. It, it. it kind of baffles their mind. Yeah. Um, but no, I never really felt the pressure uh, of of that. Of you know, just because you know, I, I look, man, I, I grew up down the street. I didn't know Easy growing up, but mm-hmm. my mother played bingo with his mother. Oh, we grew wow. up down the street from one another. He's you know cons- considerably older than than mm-hmm. I than I was as a kid. But you know, seeing that you know growing up in Compton, in you know, I'm, I'm I was born in, in, in 1970s. You know, mm-hmm. so growing up in uh, in the in the 80s. Mm-hmm. You know, when when the shit was hitting the fan. Yeah, you know, crack. Yeah. Gang violence and, and all of that. That, that just started here in Compton first, right? Yeah. As far as the rest of the nation. That, that, yeah, that, you know, I, I was at ground zero for mm-hmm. that, man. You know, home of the drive by. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, so uh, I'm one of the fortunate ones, you know, to have made it to be able, you know, to uh, to live through that from my block and my neighborhood in that era, and and be able to you know, to tell these stories and, and to go back to that community, to right. my community and, and help bring up the next generation. Right. Now, Jasmine is a stand-up comedian. Is she? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why does he keep oh, coming for me, Lord? I'm, I'm starting to freak out. I didn't keep coming oh, Jasmine, me, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. I, I think stand-up I think and acting being and honest I'm a chef. Yeah, and okay. I can do your sewing if you need it. Okay, well, I can do all of that except sewing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But I bring that up because I've heard you talk about starting and stand up early and not having a good run of it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man, you can never uh, have a good run of comedy when your name is Tasty Tony. Oh Was that your God. name? Uh, Tasty Tony, the one and only. If there's another, he's a phony. <laughs> uh, yeah. That sounds like a boondocks guy. Man. Oh my gosh. Uh, sound like a smooth poet. Yeah. I uh wow. Regency West, the comedy mm-hmm. act theater, man. All of the greats have have uh, had gone through there. Mm-hmm. Um and I was like, yo. Everybody was like, yo, funny, you funny, you should get on stage. And I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I never saw myself being a stand-up comic. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a comedic actor. I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. And I just happen to be funny. And I was like, okay, well, let me, let me go do this. So I went to I went to the Comedy Act Theater, man, and I had my whole support team with me one day. <laughs> and there were too many people uh, on the list before me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I didn't get called to, to do open mic. Aww. So uh, the next week I went. Nobody could make it. Uh, but I was like, that's cool. I, I'm, I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first two comics, and I got there extra early, the first two comics that got up ahead of me were horrible. Mm-hmm. And I heckled them. No, you didn't. I did. <laughs> oh I did. God. And I was fucking hysterical as a heckler. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and... <laughs> And uh, they just happened to call my name next mm-hmm. as I got my biggest laugh as a heckler. Right. So, OK. And nobody That's knew who setup. I was. Yeah, right. yeah. Nobody knew who I was. They, they, they were like, Tasty Tony. Nobody knew who the fuck Tasty, Tasty Tony, Tony was. <laughs> and and I, I was, you know, I was caught, you know, at the fork of the road. I was mm-hmm. like, do I get up now? Or do I just sit here and just, you know, bask in this laughter at somebody else's expense? And I was like, no, nah, you got, you know, you came here to tell jokes. Mm-hmm. So get up and tell your jokes and face the music. And so when I got up and everybody saw that it was me, uh, there's nothing worse than being ridiculed and heckled and talked about uh, than be having that done to you in a room full of comedians. Mm-hmm. And as I walked... Yeah, I've seen that happen. You know, yes, as we I... were in as, that room. At, oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> What's that? What's that? Oh, there was oh. some some we Someone me and her was, so well. yeah mm. we was at a we was in a room like a private room yeah where, and it was it was it was bad yeah. no it, <laughs> it, it 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 was like dead man walking for mm-hmm. me Damn. but I was willing to face that because I was like all right let me get up here and do this and I got on the stage and everybody in there was throwing darts and daggers at me and talking about my mama talking about mm-hmm. me talking about my fade talking about this and and i couldn't get through anything Dang. so literally 15 seconds if that they shut my mic off oh no <laughs> the house just shut my mic off because they knew i wasn't gonna i wasn't wow. gonna be they, they were saving mic, me though? yeah they were saving me the embarrassment wow. so they shut my mic off and i 
And so I threw the mic down. I was like, I don't need a fucking mic. And then so I was going. Five seconds later, they shut the light off. No. So I'm just standing there in darkness as everybody <laughs> is shitting on me. But Whoa. rightfully, but rightfully so. Right. You yeah. earned that. Yeah. You earned that. And so I, my first time touching a mic on stage, I was on stage maybe 20 seconds. And <laughs> and I left. And I had never failed at anything in my craft like mm-hmm. that before. So I went to the bathroom and I was shaking mm-hmm. uncontrollably. And Guy Tory came into the bathroom. Shout and, out to Guy Tory. Yeah, and I had no idea who Guy Tory mm-hmm. was. Uh, and he was like, hey man, how you doing? I was like, I'm all right. He was like, don't let that get to you, man. Mm-hmm. Keep getting back up. I was like, I will. He was like, you know what not to do next uh-huh. time. Mm. And I was like, bet. I drove home in silence. Uh, with the windows down and tears streaming down my face mm. Mm. Uh, because I was so humbled by that experience. And um, and I didn't touch a mic for maybe five or six years after that. Mm. I was like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I'm just going to do this acting thing. And then somebody, uh, it was my birthday one weekend. My boy was like, he brought two Heinekens over to me. And he was like, yo. Happy birthday. I was like, oh, thanks, man. He was like, oh, oh, these aren't your gifts. These are for you to get ready. Your birthday present, I signed you up for open mic night. <laughs> uh, and they about to start. It was And it was a club that turned into a comedy club at midnight. Okay. And um, and so I had to get on stage. I was forced to get on stage and forced to face my fears. Mm-hmm. Will I be funny? Can mm-hmm. I do this? And it was kind of cathartic for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I sat there and, and I did it. And I literally laid on the stage after a few minutes of getting laughs because mm-hmm. it, it, I, I wow. it, it, it just felt so good to mm-hmm. me. And I was like, yo, I needed this. Right. I, right. Yeah. I needed this in order for me to move on. And uh, from that moment, you know, I, I never looked back as, as an entertainer, not mm-hmm. as a comic, but as an entertainer. Mm-hmm. One love to guy, Tori, um, you and him went on to work on things together. Yeah. You know, life. Interesting. You bring that up mm-hmm. and say that because I was going to follow into that mm-hmm. on the set of life. It, now over the years guy and i had become friends and mm-hmm. on the set of life i went to guy and i was like hey man let me let me ask you something guy because guy used to host mm-hmm. the comedy act theater. right and that, guy that, is that, still as an actor he's incredible but in the stand-up space oh, he's really made yeah. such a great name for himself and yeah. he's been famous for helping out other comics yeah mm-hmm. definitely yeah. and so i went to him i was like hey guy you may not even remember this man but i'm i'm gonna I'm 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 tell you how you helped me mm-hmm. with something and i told the story that i just told and he was like, yo, I remember that. Right. He said, I don't remember that being you, but right. I remember that night. And he was like, yo, I felt sorry for that nigga. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like, yeah, that nigga was me. Right. You know, and I was like, and, and I just had to dap him up. And I was like, yo, thank you for those words. And he let's just quit. He was like, yo, get back up. You know what not to do next mm-hmm. time. And that just that stayed with me. And I just had to thank him for that. And and our friendship has flourished mm-hmm. ever since that moment, even before he knew who I was. And I knew mm-hmm. who he was to this day. That's that's my man. Right. Now, you worked on that. That movie is like Eddie Murphy, Mar Lawrence, Bernie Mac. What lessons did you take from that oh, experience? Yes. Oh, and that was early in your career, man. That was the beginning. Yeah. That, that was my first movie. So for my first movie to be life with Eddie Murphy, Martin Lawrence, Bernie Mac, uh, I learned I just sat back. And I was just the fly on the wall, mm-hmm. um, just watching things. And I'll never forget, there was a moment where we were sitting in the mess hall right before Eddie Murphy got into a fight. His character got into a fight over my cornbread. Oh. Mm-hmm. My character was cooking. <laughs> so I, Classic uh, moment and, in, in movie history. Yeah, so we're sitting there and I'm watching. We're all doing our, uh, we're all doing our dialogue for mm-hmm. our close-ups and all that for, you know, and... Then, you know, Bernie Mac was doing his thing. Uh, and then it came time for Bernie's close up. And when the camera turned on Bernie, it was like he kicked it into a whole nother gear. I mean, mm-hmm. he was there giving his off screen lines to everybody right. as char- as his character and doing all that. But when it became his, his close up, mm-hmm. Bernie, I learned not to waste anything when the camera's not on you. Yeah. And when the camera turned on to Bernie, I was like, yo, mm. 
I was like, this shit is incredible. Right. And that's when I saw the brilliance and the genius of Bernie Mac mm. as an entertainer, as an actor. Right. Um, the way that he became this character mm. when it was time for him to be this character. Right. It was it was just amazing. So that's that's what I learned. I, I, I f- that from him and specificity from Jim Carrey on Me, Myself, and Irene. Right. Uh, though, though, yeah, though, those are the two biggest lessons that I, I learned on any film project. You right. know, don't waste it and don't give all your magic away mm. until the camera is on you. I learned that from Bernie. And then specificity in everything that you do while mm. on camera, I learned from Jim Carrey. You also worked on a Bernie Mac show. Yes. As well. Um, so it's like that helped with that relationship. But it's interesting. Was Now, was life... Somebody help me. Was life before or after Kings of Comedy? I think it was after. No, it was before. It was he was I still think, he was I think still it was before. It was before. What's interesting about mm. King of Comedy is um because that was nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, but Bernie, yeah. everybody was on television and Bernie wasn't. Mm-hmm. And it's that whole bit about him like I need a show. Right. And then the Bernie Mac, then the show becomes out of that routine that he did mm-hmm. with the with the kids. Mm-hmm. Right, the, the show becomes that. That show, and I just thought about this as I'm talking to you, there's a lot of parallels with Blackish and the Bernie Mac show. Yes. In terms of your you're narrating, talking to America mm-hmm. from a black perspective, mm-hmm. you know, is, is definitely there. But let's go back to, we don't get into Blackish later. Right. Talk about um the Farrelly brothers and yeah. and Jim Carrey. And that's the first time I saw you. Oh, really? Me, myself, yeah. and Irene. You know, because okay. I, I remember how big, you know, just um, Dumb and Dumber, that's their first one, right? Mm-hmm. And then something about Mary was just a zeitgeist. Like that was like the funniest movie we had seen in yeah. a long time. Yeah. So me, myself, and Irene was a follow up to something about Mary, and I remember being excited and going to. The, I remember going to the theater like, oh, they they linking back up with Jim Carrey because I'm right. a, I'm a film fan. I'm like, yeah. I'm going, I'm 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 ready for the belly laughs. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And the 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 genius black babies. I'm like, yo, right. they've taken chances here right. with race. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. You know what was it like working on that that film? That shit was in was incredible man Mm -hmm. uh just the process you know auditioning for it and and meeting the Farrelly brothers and Mm -hmm. and then being cast uh you know as Jim Carrey's son (laughs) (laughs) he got three black triplet babies that don't look nothing alike right (laughs) and they don't damn sure don't look shit like him right uh but but like I say I remember my first day on set it was a big scene with Jim Carrey just going crazy Mm -hmm. and you know, if you watch Jim Carrey's work, you just think that his shit is just zany and off the wall. He mm-hmm. just comes and it just comes off the top of his head and and you hope the camera catches something remotely funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned specificity mm. from him. I learned that everything that he does is calculated and thought out. Mm-hmm. It's not that they just yell you know, action and he just bounces off a wall and mm-hmm. he's like, oh, I think we got it. Mm-hmm. No, everything that he did... Right had a purpose. Was it r- written that way or are you just seeing what he's doing mentally? Combination of both. Okay. Combination of both, but more so on what Jim was doing and what mm-hmm. he was bringing to that character. The words are on the page. They they are what they are, but but how he created this character and 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 what he brought to it mm-hmm. and just the transformation that you saw that he went from from Hank in, into the the mm-hmm. other character. It's it was it was just incredible to right. watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It was just he controlled his energy. Is it true and correct to say that you studied with Ozzy Davis and Ruby D? It's true. Okay, that's uh, incredible, brother. Yeah, yeah. We we used to. You doing your research? Um, <laughs> so that's what we do here. Yeah, the I was. Yeah, I was. I was a theater major. Mm-hmm. At, at, at I was too. At, at Howard, Howard University. University. Howard. H U. Yeah. Our, our director okay. is Howard. Right, Bison. See. Yeah, Bison. That's what I learned. You know my grandmother. Each other. Who's your grandmother? Carol Singleton. Yes. That was the dean of fine arts. I dare you. Her favorite line was, I dare you. We broke on stage one day and she made us freeze on stage in this production of Voodoo. And she said, I dare you. Mm. This woman's maybe about four foot 11. like my size. Four foot 11. Didn't you say that your father taught at the school that Robert Glasper was at? This keeps happening. Her well, family's my, everywhere. Uh, my, we are everywhere. But no, my grandmother, uh, she, you know, she, she, you were one of the students, obviously, she talks about. And um, my art also brought up a thing. Um, did you know my grandfather, too? I don't know if you like, um, he was a dean at Howard as well. Who was your grandfather? Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, happened? shit, here it come. 
Singleton. Everybody trying to claim somebody. Let's see if, <laughs> Benny let's see if this I'm shit so is real. Sorry. Let's see if this shit is real. Benny Singleton. I just had like a brain fart or something. Oh, like yeah, okay. But he worked in the PR, so you might not okay, have known Okay, no, him no, too. I, I didn't but know But yeah, him. my grandmother talked about you a lot. Yeah, no, Carol Singleton. Yeah, Dr. Carol Singleton. Yeah, she yeah. was the dean of fine arts. That's uh, dope. But what we, what we would do as students, we would, um, we had a great uh, student body mm-hmm. uh, in the College of Fine Arts. So, we would have Ruby D and Nasi Davis come in once a month and teach a master class. Okay. And so uh for uh I can't remember if it was for a semester or for a full year, um uh, Ruby D and Nasi Davis mm-hmm. would come and and work with us one on one. Uh yeah, so yeah, yeah, you're right. You're correct in saying that okay. I, I studied with Ozzy Davis they, and Ruby D. Uh lived down the street from my grandmother who was an actress. Mm. Her name is Javodi Green. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were friends with she was friends with the with the Davises. Yeah. And, and um, yeah. I remember seeing them around when I was little. And, you know, they're such a huge part of, you know, black cinema, black theater. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, it's that that I see the connection. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like I said, I see when when you're connected to Ruby D and them. Right. And Ozzy Davis, like that's 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 official. Um, you know, when I was doing your intro, I mentioned The Departed. Yeah. And Martin Scorsese, who recently said that Marvel films are like amusement parks, which I was like, I love amusement parks. <laughs> they are, though. Who, don't who doesn't? Love, who doesn't like going to the amusement with park? the water, you're yeah. moving the chairs. <laughs> so he was accurate about that, but he cast you for The Departed, which, I mean, he, Martin Scorsese has so many good films. Yes. I, so many good films. Mm-hmm. And that's not, that's no slouch. No. That's one, that's one of the top ones. Yeah. Um, how did you get that part? Um, uh, I I I I have a brain fart right now. I can't mm-hmm. remember the casting director's name for the movie, but mm-hmm. she called me in, mm-hmm. and I went and auditioned for her. And uh, this is a, this is a crazy story. Uh, and I get a call back. Martin Scorsese says he's going to be in town for the Oscars, mm-hmm. and he wants to see you. Mm-hmm. And he is uh, staying at the Bel Air Hotel. At the time, I was on the television show called The Shield. Okay, and we were out in South Central, like on 80-something. And we were in the hood. Mm-hmm. Um, my audition was at 3.30. I'm in South Central LA. Martin Scorsese is in Bel Air. Mm-hmm. Drive time, tra- bumper to bumper traffic. It's LA. I get mm-hmm. released on lunch. The production for The Shield is trying to stop me from going to my audition <laughs> with Martin Scorsese. Right. So now I'm trying to figure out, before this, how am I going to get to the Bel Air Hotel from 86 and Western? Oh, my God. In rush hour traffic. This was my dilemma a day or two before my call, my call back. This is like a Scorsese meeting. film right here. Yeah. The story. So I'm, I'm like, yo, what are we going to do? Uh, my manager was like, uh, yo, man, we can, we can get an ambulance. We can get a motorcycle. <laughs> wow. I was like, yo, no. You know what? Let's get a helicopter. Yeah. Let's get a helicopter. I said, I'm close to downtown L.A. I can drive to downtown L.A., uh, get it on one of these high-rise buildings and fly to Century City, and that'll put me right there at uh, Bel Air. Well, because of 9-11, you have to have a three-day advance notice on either end of your travel oh. when mm-hmm. flying in L.A. on helicopters now. So that was, that was 86th. So I was like, damn, what are we going to do? My manager came up with a great idea. We got an ambulance. We got an ambulance to take you. Wow. But now, Aunt, they can't turn on the siren. Mm. They can't run through traffic because it's it's not an emergency. But we found it. I was like, well, why the hell they want to drive me around then if they can't turn on the siren? <laughs> point. So I was like, okay, we can't do that. So we go back to a driver. And I was like, well, yeah, but that was still stuck in traffic. I can get you a motorcycle. Uh, you can get on the back. You can weave in out of traffic. And I was like, yeah, but I need to study these lines. So we went with the driver. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to the day of, they post a PA outside of my uh, dressing room door on my lunch break. And she stops me as I'm walking out. She's like, where are you going? Because I, <laughs> I have a driver there now. Right. I was like, I'm, I'm going to my meeting. She was like, oh, no, you can't. I was like, who the right. fuck are you? Whoa. Right. I was like, no. Nah. I said, it's my lunch break, right? She said, yeah. I said, okay. I'll see you yeah. when lunch is over. Right. Right. So I get in the car. The brother will not speed oh or do God, anything the worst driver for in me life. in this. And I was like, man, I was like, dog, I said, I have an hour mm-hmm. to get from 86 in Western mm-hmm. to Bel Air audition and back, and back in rush hour traffic. I need you to do something for mm-hmm. me, dog. He wouldn't do anything. I get to the Bel Air Hotel. 
It's a who's who of every white actor that you've ever seen in your life for this Martin Scorsese mm -hmm. film. I'm the only brother there. Wow. And they're auditioning for other characters and all of that. So I get in, casting director says, Anthony, um, Martin will see you now. So I get in, I'm like, okay. I'm like, Mr. Scorsese, he's like, call me Marty. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, Marty. And so we're going through. I was like, yo, I'm just a fan. And he starts blushing. He's like, oh, stop, stop. I was like, no, I just had to say that because of your work and all that. But let's get to business. Mm -hmm. We go through our audition. We read two scenes. And he's literally, he has a stack of papers and scripts on in front of him. He just starts looking for shit. He's looking. And he can't find it. And I was like, what are you looking for? He said, there's another scene that I want you to do. Mm -hmm. I said, I can't find it. I said, hey, Marty. I said, this is what you can do. I said, give me the job and I'll read whatever you want me to read on the day. Mm. He laughs. He said, I like that. So we leave. The casting director walks me out. I give her a hug to thank her for bringing me in. Mm -hmm. And during my embrace, she says, Anthony, you're in the movie. Oh, wow. my gosh. I said, what? She said, the job is yours. You're the only one I brought in for this character. Yes. Wow. I get in the car with the brother. I said, take your time going back. <laughs> Word up. I'm coming yeah. on a date. That's yeah. Yeah. Word up. And you know what's crazy? I get back to work. Mm -hmm. They still don't need me for another hour and a half. Of course they don't. <laughs> Hurry up and wait. Uh, but so that's that's my uh that's my Martin Scorsese no departed story. Only two black men have really had roles in Martin Scorsese movies. Mm -hmm. Samuel Jackson. L. Jackson. Right. Anthony Anderson. And they killed that nigga quick. Yeah. Yeah, they they waited to they waited to the end to kill me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah they, got, they killed you a got bunch killed of, at the end. They killed a bunch of white folks. They, right. they killed Leonardo DiCaprio before they killed right, him. Right, right. So I was good. Yeah, as long yeah. as you don't go first, you're fine. Yeah. You're in there. Now you have a lot of range, obviously. Mm -hmm. Departed with Martin Scorsese. Yes. But you also won a Razzie or uh, for oh no you didn't win you would you didn't win a Razzie. Uh -huh. You were nominated for a Razzie. I was nominated for but a Razzie. you won a Kids Choice Award. Yeah. For best fart in a movie. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> kangaroo jack right now what was that experience like because i remember when that movie came out and that had to be a, a strange time uh that was dope man mm -hmm. um yo that was uh 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 jerry bruckheimer mm -hmm. i get a call yo and you're on a short list Jerry Bruckheimer wants you to do this movie and that, the, the original title of the movie was called Down and Under mm -hmm. and I was like alright and they were like you know the lead's gonna be Jerry O'Connell I was like okay I knew Jerry O'Connell in passing we, had mm -hmm. the, we were at the same agency at the time so mm -hmm. we went and sat at Norm's Cafe uh, before our, mm -hmm. our audition and just read some stuff LA together LA Land Landmark Good old yeah. Norms, right? just, for, uh, just for some chemistry uh, between the two of us and I don't know who the other two actors were, mm -hmm. but I'll never forget. I had tapped into something in this audition mm -hmm. uh, that I, I've yet to tap into again. And I, all I remember is that I blacked out mm -hmm. until these scenes were over. And when they were over, I was drenched, mm -hmm. you know, in sweat from head to toe, just from putting whatever I Exertion. had to put into. Yeah. And this, and two days later I get a call saying the job is yours and flew over to Australia, lived in Australia for six mm. months wow. and made this movie. Mm. And, um, you know, was, was an eye opening experience mm -hmm. and, and one of the best experiences that I've had to date in this, uh, in this industry. Right. And one, because I had an epiphany while I was over there. And I'll never forget, my brother asked me years before that, he was like, yo, Anthony, have you ever thought about your journey? Mm -hmm. And if anybody knows my brother, you, this was a very poignant question by my brother. And I was like, yo, nigga, what you been reading? Right, right, <laughs> you know, right, right, right. how are you even coming at me asking me a question like right, that? Right. Like, I've known you right. my entire life and I've <laughs> like, never. Who, who is this nigga? Yeah, who the fuck are you? <laughs> like, hey, man, have you ever thought about your journey? <laughs> And while I was in uh, Australia, uh, I thought about that, man. And I was sitting in this beautiful uh, penthouse um, that I, that, I'll, I'll, I'll step. I believe that if you envision it, you see it, it comes to fruition. That's mm -hmm. right. You know, That's so right. 
when I was flying over, before I flew over to Australia, I, I'll take you one step back before I even get into that. I said, I, I want to leave. I always said I wanted to leave the country to make a movie. Mm -hmm. And without even thinking about this, I was always in Canada. And it dawned mm -hmm. on me one day. I was like, oh, I'm not being specific in the things right. that I'm asking That's a for. Word. Right. Right. It goes back to specificity. Mm -hmm. right. I was like, I'm not being specific in the things that I'm asking for because they're coming to me in its most general form, mm -hmm. which is of no use to me mm -hmm. because it's just coming generally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK, I said the next movie I do, I will need a passport to enter the country because at that time, all you needed was a birth certificate right. to get into Canada. And I was like, I will need a passport to enter this country and it will be overseas. I get the call for Jerry uh, from uh, Jerry Bruckheimer to do Down and Under, a.k.a. Uh, uh, Kangaroo Jack. Wow. I get it. Now, this is how I want to live when I live, when I get to Australia. I want the Sydney Opera House right outside my window. Mm. I said, not not want. I is will this, have. The Sydney? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Sydney. Yeah. I said, I will have the Sydney Opera House outside my window. Right. I fly over with my family. We get into the hotel. It's a it's a fly hotel. First thing I do is I open the window. What's outside my window? The opera house. The Sydney Opera House. Wow. Right. And I was like, I can't live in a hotel for six months. I said, I need the comforts of home. So I need to have a place. So I put it out there. I was like, this is how I'm going to live. And I found this beautiful penthouse in this in this on this perch called Potts Point, mm -hmm. uh, right above uh uh, uh, the water mm -hmm. to the left is the downtown Sydney skyline right in front of me is Sydney Opera House right to the right is uh, uh, North Sydney Island and then Sydney Harbor mm -hmm. and just water in between and the place is wall to wall ceiling to floor glass windows mm -hmm. and a wrap around balcony and so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about what my brother said. Have I thought about my journey? And I'm blazing one. It's the middle of the night. The windows are open and I, the curtains are open. And I see all of this in the middle of the night. It's lit up. And life, I'm flicking through the channel. Mm. And life comes on. Whoa. And I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, damn. I'm about to, I'm about, this is my first scene in life. It's about to happen. Right. And that's when it hits me. And I sit back and I'm looking at, I'm like, life. And I'm looking at how I'm living right now mm -hmm. and what my life is. And then I look at the movie Life and I was like, that's my first movie. That is my birth into this industry mm -hmm. right. that I'm living right now. It's because of my work in life that I have the opportunity that I'm having right now in Kangaroo mm -hmm. Jack. And all that shit came full circle to me. Mm. So whenever anybody asks me what's the best project that I've worked on to date, it's kangaroo jack wow. because of this epiphany that mm -hmm. i had and right. this self-realization of what it is that i'm doing and where i see myself going let's talk about this cultural phenomenon that is blackish yes um i'm a 70s baby uh -huh. just like you are i grew up on like norman lear era oh, sitcoms yes. that were you know these actors came from the stage mm -hmm. they came mm -hmm. from the theater a lot of them a lot of them um had parts were known in the culture you know but they you know they they new life was breathed into them from doing all in the family and the jeffersons and all these shows that had huge laughs mm -hmm. great writing but really really went into the social commentary unapologetically mm -hmm. and for a lot of people in this generation um you know i feel like there was a, a couple of generations skipped that Mm -hmm. And Black is, has kind of brought that back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did you know how big this show was going to get when you started it? No. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't. Uh, we could only hope uh, for the success that, that, that we have and, mm -hmm. and for our show to be in the zeitgeist the way that it is mm -hmm. right now. Kenya Barris, who is my partner in this, who created our show, um, we have the same manager. Mm -hmm. And Kenya had been trying to... Uh, meet with me for quite some time now mm -hmm. and it never happened and mm -hmm. it just so happened that stars finally aligned and we had this meeting mm -hmm. and we sat back and we talked about what we wanted to do in television mm -hmm. uh, but more importantly we talked about what was missing from television 
for us as viewers, mm -hmm. he and I in particular. And we talked about all the shows that you just mentioned, All mm -hmm. in the Family, The Jeffersons, Good Times, mm -hmm. Cosby, Bernie Mac, mm -hmm. you know, shows where, you know, characters were unapologetic in who they were. Right. You knew uh, that Archie Bunker, you knew where you stood with Archie mm -hmm. Bunker. That's right. You know, you knew the type of person that he was. Right. Uh, the bigot and the races that he was, but you knew where you stood with be him. Because the, it was honest. Exactly. You were able to laugh with it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Honest and authentic. Yeah. Same thing with the Jeffersons, Good Times, all of that. And so we sat up and talked about that. And then we started, we pushed all that to the side. And then we just started talking about our personal lives. Mm -hmm. Kenya is from Inglewood. Mm -hmm. I'm from Compton. Mm -hmm. Both of us are first generation successful. Mm -hmm. Both of us are the only African-American families that live in our respective neighborhoods. There's the story. You know, mm -hmm. both of our, our families are the few black families at the private school that our children attend. Mm -hmm. And so we just talked about those things. And he was sharing his stories with me and I'm sharing my stories with him. Like my son, not only was he the only chocolate drop in his <laughs> class he was right. the only chocolate drop in his grade right wow. fly for, boy in the blood in yeah, the buttermilk exactly yeah. for three years whoa for mm. three years he's the only chocolate drop around there are others around but in his class and in his grade so every time he moved up someplace he was the only one mm -hmm. so we talked about that and you know what, what we put in the pilot was was part of the story of my son talking to me about you know him not actually he came to my sister-in-law and said he didn't feel black Oh, mm. damn. You know, mm. and I understood where he was coming from because of all of my hard work that we have done. You know, we, we're in the suburbs. We're the only black family. There's another black family down the street in our neighborhood. Um, he sees what's going on around him the, uh, in the world with black youth, and that's mm -hmm. not happening to him. Right. He sees how my brother and my, my brothers and my sisters and, and my family are still in the hood in right. Compton and mm -hmm. Watts. That's not his reality. So, you know, he was like, yo, he felt less black. And I'm like, yo, this is your black experience. Mm -hmm. Right. And because right. this is your black experience and because you're not experiencing those things doesn't make you any less black than who you are. Mm -hmm. And I was like, son. I, I looked at him and I said, yo, I'm a nigga. Right. right. I was like, I was like, you're a nigga. And I was like, and unfortunately, one day it's going to be thrown in your face mm -hmm. how much of a nigga you really are. That's right. And hopefully I've given you and equipped you with the tools to deal with that when that happens. Right. My son looked at me and said, I get it, dad. Mm. For my 13th birthday, can I have a bar mitzvah? <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, yeah. you really ain't a nigga, are you? <laughs> and, you know, we joked about it. We had fun. I was like, son, that's not our culture. That's not our heritage. That's, uh, we can't do that. And we went back and forth. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, he came up with this idea. He saw something. And I was like, yo, that's what we'll do. I said, I'll throw you a bro mitzvah. A bro mitzvah. Yeah. That was an episode. Yeah, that, that was our pilot. <laughs> right. You know, it was our story. So yeah. I threw him a bro mitzvah. I trademarked the name bro mitzvah. Um, I had Adidas and Shell to Adidas to his entire eighth grade class. Whoa. I had Kango, St. Kango's. I bought Gazelles. We had a Cuban link chain <laughs> and all that. I had a I had an airbrush artist do a, a 16 by 20 right. step and repeat. Black culture. Yeah. And to this day, my son's 19 now, to this day, all those boys he grew up with who were Jewish says the best bar mitzvah they've ever gone to. And that looked like a Drake video. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, and that was, that was, I'm not, that was what we talked about. That was our show. Mm -hmm. And and those are the stories that we tell. And, and that's what we pitched now, to what, all these networks. That's interesting to me. Like, you know, you and me are relatively the same age. And I'm a father as well. Mm-hmm. And my son is around the same age as your son. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I um, I remember when my parents were in their 40s. Right. They didn't. They were great. Yeah. But they had no swag. Right. <laughs> parents back then just weren't supposed to have any swag. No. Right. Cookie on Blackish, and, you know, with all due respect, brother, your gear is, is pretty much on point. Yeah. And there's the sneaker fetish that's mm -hmm. a damn near character of the show. Yeah. Like your love for Jordans is damn near character. Right. Is that you and Kenya together? Is that you? Like, where did the Jordan thing come from? Uh, come on. We, we come from that era, man. Right. But that, 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 that's really, 
that's really Kenya. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a marriage of all right. of us. The writing that, on the show was in, that, that, that's, immaculate, that's, brother. That's, that's really Kenya, yeah. man. And you know, be, because of uh, my proximity, right, to Kenya and and what the, this character is, it's now become mine, right. Um, but yeah, no, we 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 try to be fly, man. We we try to be fly, and you know, and and that that's. That's what it's all about, you know, mm-hmm. to be aspirational. Right. It's crazy that uh, you spoke on where you said your son said he didn't feel black because he wasn't living in things. And that's why it's so important to have a show like Blackish because the black experience has changed. Yeah. And not only has it changed, it's never just been felt or anything like that anyway. Right. And it's like now when you have other shows where it shows black kids with money or black kids having to deal with white people problems and stuff like that, people need to see that because they can get more used to us and realize we're not all just freaking killers or anything. Yeah, and, and this is nothing, and this isn't new. No. You mm. know, this isn't new. This has been our reality since the beginning of our time mm. right. here in this country. This is what we do. Right, and I think it's important for you to to note that you just, just did the um, having, we talked about code switching and having a dual experience. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah, like you have a, 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 a nice house in a suburb, but you still have this very close proximity to these hood elements that even, that, that white people just don't have, even poor white people mm-hmm. still have a degree of privilege that, that right. poor black people mm-hmm. don't have. So yeah. you have this, so it's like, it's interesting to hear you talk about that because, you know, that's that's part of it. The, the black experience is often, you know, we talked about my Twitter experience early in, in the hallway. Mm. And, um, you know, a vast amount of people who troll me on Twitter are people who pretend to be black. Mm. Mm. And I come from educators. Both my mm. parents are professors. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a great de- de- great deal of educational privilege. To be raised in a house of two professors is not as rare. Mm. And um and I and I respect it, but that doesn't diminish my blackness. Right. And so a lot of times you have these these f- nameless, faceless, anonymous trolls who will say Talib Kweli, you, your parents are educators. You're not really black. Crazy. And so a show like Blackish for someone like me mm-hmm. is very important. Like while I'm not, my family is not as financially as stable as the family on this TV show. Right. The idea that being wealthy being educated mm-hmm. living in a different type of neighborhood somehow diminishes your blackness mm-hmm. yeah. is something that racists weaponize against us all the time yes. and so this show is sort of a shield against that yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what's crazy um, my first television show uh, was a Saturday morning show called Hang Time mm-hmm. by a high school basketball team I mm-hmm. was the black guy on the show I was Teddy Bear <laughs> and I'll never forget one of my co-stars uh, I met his mother for the first time. Mm-hmm. They're Jewish. And, you know, I met them. We had a great time. My buddy came to work the next day and was incensed and upset with his mother because of a comment that she made. Mm-hmm. And he shared that comment with me. I was like, well, what is it, man? And he was like, after my mother met you, she said, he speaks so well. Mm. Right. Speak so well for what? Yeah. For mm. for a fat guy, <laughs> you know, speak so well for because right. you know the farthest thing from my mind is oh, I speak so I speak so well because I'm black. What, right. what what does she mean? I speak so well because I'm an actor, mm-hmm. you know. And he was like, you know what I mean. And I was like, yeah, I know I'm fucking with you, man. But <laughs> you know, just that that's that's you know why is it because we speak proper. Mm-hmm. I, I can't even say proper. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't you even enunciate say that. your syllables. Yeah, and, and, and why is it because I'm well read right. makes me less black? Right. Why they call, is they it, call it speaking of, white? Yeah. yeah. Why is right. it because I'm educated? Dealt with that. You know, I'm I'm less black. Mm-hmm. I, I I never understood that. Yeah, that's it's another purpose. weapon. That's, yeah, it's another weapon because it's like they want you to feel like all oh, black people are stupid, and it's like we're not. I when you grow up in a black neighborhood, you see that there's smart blacks, there's the, the blacks that are going to mm-hmm. skip school. It's the same as everybody that's else. Right. You're going to have your bad yeah. apples, and you're going to have your great people, but it's not that's all right. bad. That's no. that's why respectability politics is is not really the path to liberation. And y'all deal with this on the show yeah. mm-hmm. and several over several episodes. The idea that if we pull up our pants mm-hmm. and speak proper, that somehow we're going to receive another just like they beat Martin Luther King ass with, right. suit. with that suit on. Mm-hmm. You know right. what I'm saying? And so, um, you know, that's the idea that we have to change who we are. That we 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 can be negative. 
We can be wrong. We can be fucked up. We can be silly, mm -hmm. but we can be great. We can be powerful. We can be beautiful. Yeah. We can be excellent. All of that. We can be all of that. All of that. Yeah. And that's why you have like the like I talked about before. You know how you have trap yoga or trap chefs and stuff like that, or like even like psychologists, whatever. Now you're having psychologists that you can go and you can sit down and they can talk to you in ebonics if you want, or you can talk in really? proper ink. Yeah, well, my, hold on, hold on, I was like, what I don't, I don't, I don't, no, I don't think I won't. I don't think I want my degrees. therapist talking you, to me. Wait, you can, you can check degrees. the box yeah. like. Listen, Ebonics. guys. Talk to me like a nigga. Talk to me and jive. What I'm saying is that. No, they, nigga, I don't want jive. <laughs> what I'm saying is that they're relatable. Like, they're not like they're not just cookie cutter psychologists. Right. They're people that lived, that are from the streets that are just right. educated and they can still sit down and talk to you like a friend so that you can feel like you can open up to them. Right. Uh, well, I want my psychologist to tell me she's or he is about to go someplace, not finna go someplace. <laughs> okay, that's, that's that. I that's don't all use I'm a finna word at all. That's all know. I'm saying. Oh, but oh, I, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> you get um, where I'm coming from, though. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean. Um, on this show, you have a uh, young child, teenage actors mm -hmm. who are just fantastic. Yara and Marseille, Marcus, and you know, you've gotten to watch these actors grow. Yes. As people from little kids, um, Miles Brown. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Jack from the Loop Pack. Yeah. Are you a Loop Pack fan? Oh yeah, man. Come on, man. You know, what so, you know about Jack, man. Uh, come on, man. What I know about Jack? I'm, <laughs> when when my record, so me and Jared, Jared started Ruckus Records. Uh, my record came out of Ruckus in nineteen. When when did we drop? Nineteen ninety seven. Four to five live. Back we to six to three. Yeah, back in the days, <laughs> I had to walk to school 13 miles. Uphill, yeah. both ways. <laughs> no feet. I mean, no shoes. <laughs> no feet. We didn't have feet. <laughs> <laughs> didn't have feet, but I had shoes. <laughs> You put them on my head. I put <laughs> shoes on my stumps. Um, you know, we dropped the record, oh, and my I was proud to have my record in Fat Beats. Mm. But on that shelf was the loot pack. Yeah. And that album, Jesus. Um, Mad Lib, Oh No, DJ Rome, Jack, mm -hmm. Wild Child, you know, it's like, I don't think the, I don't think them dudes really understand how much of an influence that they had on me. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, me and Oh No work together. He's done a lot of records for me. Um, mm -hmm. Me and Mad Lib got an album together. Right. Mad Lib produced the whole next Black Star album. But you know, even Jack with his style, man, like he's a fantastic MC, a phenomenal MC. Yeah. And what, what, what him and his family, what they've done with Miles mm -hmm. and the environment they've created for him to grow and prosper in is just right. wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. Um, but yeah, talk to me about watching those kids grow as actors and as people at the same time. That's, I'm proud of both, man. Mm -hmm. I, and, and I'm proud that I get to be a part uh, of that growth on mm -hmm. both sides, mm -hmm. personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. Because all of these kids... I handpicked, wow. you know, Miles and Kayla when they were nine years old, you know, they're 15 now, mm. you know, I've seen the growth in them as actors, but more importantly, I've seen the growth in all of these children um, as people, mm. as individuals. And, and that's what I'm excited about. Mm. I mean, I'm, I mean, I look at what Yara Shahidi is doing right yeah. now, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just, it's just amazing, man, to, to be able to sit back and say that I'm a part of her life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, not that she's a part of mine. Right. I'm a part of her. Right. I'm down with her. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't wait to see the mark that she's going to leave on this earth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, she's kind of already left a mark. If she does nothing else, she's already left a mark. She touches people's lives in their TV screen and politically. Like, yeah. I just watched her at the Obama mm -hmm. summit and I was listening to her speak. And I'm just like, wow. Like, and she's what, 18, 19? Yeah. And she's been like that since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. She was like that when we cast her. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I knew great things were happening mm -hmm. for her. You know, just from meeting her the first time. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's just it's just a beautiful thing. You know, Yara, Miles, Marseille, and right. Marcus. I, I I love I love the people that they are, but you know, and, and it brings me joy to see them grow as actors yeah. every day. Yeah. You know, I get to I get to see them and I get to play with them and I get to see how their confidence has grown from zero to a thousand from day one to now. Right. Now here's another connection. Um 
I don't know if this was her first thing because she's so talented. There's probably a bunch of things I didn't know, but Tracy Ellis Ross was on the Lyricist Lounge TV show, mm. which was also now, Lyricist Lounge was a collective of artists that I came yeah. in the game with. They had a, a deal on Raucous. Um, that Lyricist Lounge album came out and then quickly MTV took over that show. And full disclosure, I never was a fan of the show. I think, okay. you know, I think, really? I think the MTV people got involved in it and it wasn't what the lyrics, it became like a sketch comedy yeah, show yeah. and not really a good one. Right. Oh. You know, but Tracy Ellis Ross shined on that show. Mm -hmm. She shone on that show. Um, talk to me a little bit about how she got involved in working with her because she's become so iconic for the culture. Oh, oh yes. yes. She's a role model. Uh, same thing, man. She came in, uh, everybody, all, all the women came in and auditioned uh, for Bo on Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, and it was maybe 10, 12 of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just some corny shit. I had a rose for every one of the actresses <laughs> oh my that gosh. came in. It was Valentine's Day. Right. They were, so I was like, yo, right. they're coming in to be my wife. So, you know, and, and Tracy came in in the middle of the pack and did the first scene. No notes. Mm -hmm. Did the second scene. We didn't have any notes for. Uh, and uh, I was like, yo, Tracy, um, you can go out there and tell them other heifers they can go. <laughs> she said, I'm not going to tell them that. I was like, all right, well, I'll tell them. But you can you can go right. out there. I said, the job is yours. Right. You know, that wow. that's that's how it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I had known Tracy uh, before now. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize Tracy hated me as much as she did. <laughs> Until we were uh, uh, halfway through the first season. What? Mm -hmm. Tracy and I had hosted uh, the first Vibe Awards. I remember that. Back in the day. And y'all looked like y'all was having a lot of fun. We were having, <laughs> at least I thought we were having a lot of fun. <laughs> and so we were, we were walking out uh, mid-show and there was a loud, Arr! as we were walking out. And I just turned, it was like, Tracy, did you fart? <laughs> and you know the, the crowd it was this is a funny joke and mm. the crowd went crazy I had no idea that offended her the Why way that it did <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> for close to 15 years <laughs> Tracy harbored this hate for me of course she did so and I'm thinking we good money <laughs> all these years I'm thinking we good money she's a good actress we um uh, She's doing a show on, after Girlfriend, she's doing a show on BET called uh, Read Between the Lines. Mm -hmm. They call and ask me if I want to be a part of it. I'm like, yeah, I, I'd love to. I love Tracy. I love Malcolm Jamal Warner. That's mm -hmm. my dude. So I go do the show, but the majority, if not all of my scenes, are with Tracy. Right. And so we're doing our scenes and we're doing a thing. And every time, you know, there was a turnaround and it got to be my close up or whatever, Tracy would leave the set. And oh. I thought she was just like, you know, showing me respect and was mm -hmm. like, yo, Anthony got this. He's cool. I thought she was giving me her set. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> she just didn't want to fucking be around me. <laughs> you know, and she told me this halfway through the first season. We sat down and just had a hard to heart. She said, you know what, Anthony? <laughs> I really love you, but let me tell you when I started to love you because I hated you for a while. Wow. Uh and 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 that was that was that's our history. But uh, there's nothing that I wouldn't do for Tracy, mm -hmm. uh, and and I believe uh, there's nothing that she wouldn't do for me. Right. Um, she makes me a better actor, uh, and there's no uh, other person that I would rather be on this journey with. Mm. Wow. Uh, doing the things that we're doing right now with our show, um, and and I can honestly say that 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 I love her. Yeah, man, y'all do some it's important. Energy. It's great yeah. energy, Chemistry. and y'all 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 deal like I've never seen, you know you know, dysfunction dealt with in an honest way, like mm -hmm. y'all did with this season. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, there's certain episodes like the dream, the dream house episode, yeah. which was very good. Um, there's certain episodes that just leave the realm of blackish mm -hmm. and just become part of the general culture. I think it started with the word episode with the, with the N word episode. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, how important was it for y'all at so early to deal with that? Uh, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to set our mark, man, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and a lot of this, I shouldn't say a lot, all of it, uh, you know, came from the top down from Kenya. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these are things that he wanted, you know, to make a statement with mm -hmm. and, and, and touch upon. And, you know, at the time, you know, we said the N word 
13 or 14 times on mm-hmm. the show. And we we only and, and it was bleeped out every time, but mm-hmm. we we want out out of the mouths of babes. We right. wanted Miles's character because he starts the show and right. he's doing the uh, uh, Kanye song. Yeah, and we wanted to come. We wanted it to come out of his mouth, and we wanted the the world and the audience to mm-hmm. hear it. Yeah, mm-hmm. from his mouth. Yeah, because it it was coming from such an innocent and pure right. place. Mm-hmm. But the juxtaposition was interesting in in that particular episode of. When Lawrence Fishburne and Jennifer Lewis characters, mm. if your parents, explain that 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 was the most interesting part of it. It's like they were saying for our generation, they were like, "Oh no, we say nigga, yeah, but we reserve it for disdain." Yes. Mm. Whereas y'all embrace that was I've never yes. heard it framed that way. Yeah. Because especially that that scene when they cross uh, on the steps mm-hmm. and she's like, "Move it, nigga." Yeah. Like yeah. like the way that like that's exactly right. It's because. You know, when when defending hip hop and hip hop's use of the N word, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, we got it from somewhere. Right. I'm born in 1975, so when I was coming of age, everybody in hip hop was the puffy era. Yeah. Everybody wanted to be pimps and players. Right. Why? Because we grew up watching the black exploitation, mm-hmm. and we grew up a uh, 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 wanted to be that. Mm-hmm. You know, and like when we li- when we look at the culture, we we think about it like. We all been we've been calling each other nigga the whole time, right? But hip hop was the first time we did it in public. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then you got your Skylers and your Ashers and your Dylans mm-hmm. want to say it. Yeah. You yeah. know, but um, it was done so so well the way y'all handled that. Let, let, let me ask you this question, then. Mm-hmm. you know, um, coming from the hip hop world and mm-hmm. and just how we use the word as a term of endearment and we embrace mm-hmm. it and all that. Do you feel culpable in? aiding non-blacks mm-hmm. to say this to say nigga did you see the video where kendrick stopped the girl from Mm-mm. saying nigga so kendrick had a part of his show uh, white uh, yes, right yes, yes, right? yes yes where he yes. invites people on stage and just perform the song yes. and white girl said the, the the word and then he he stopped he, he graciously admonished her on stage mm-hmm. he was like you could do the song but please don't Mm-hmm. The way he did it was professional and mm-hmm. it, it was warm and everything. I'm I'm I have a very unique uh, experience in hip hop that I'm proud of. Um, certainly, I can't control all my fans. Mm-hmm. Certainly, there are Talib quality fans that say the word nigga. White people who say it and think there's nothing wrong with it. Right. But I'd be willing to bet. But that's not a real fan. That's not that's somebody who may know get by. They may have mm-hmm. heard Kanye mention my name or Jay-Z mention mm-hmm. my name. They're like, oh, that's the guy that got the group with most deaf. But that's not my real fan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My real fan who listens to my lyrics understands that you're not going to say nigga at the Talib Kweli show. Mm-hmm. The, the, the white fan who's my fan has enough appreciation for what I represent. Right. And I've, 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 I've worked to create this fan base. I every Most rappers don't have that. Mm-hmm. I don't think most rappers have a fan base that are that informed about my because I, I wear my belief you wearing a Compton t-shirt yeah you know I love Star Wars I got my Star Wars t-shirt. <laughs> right right, right. You know, but I wear my shit on my Blur. I wear it out yeah, like, yeah. I, you know I do shows when I do shows and I learned this from Immortal Technique I watched him I was touring with him Immortal Technique after every song he's barking on the crowd mm. like he's explaining his worldview I came from the school like we don't talk like people think I'm an MC that likes to like chastise people on some conscious shit but when I get on that stage I'm trying to perform right. I'm trying to rap I'm right. trying to entertain right. the drinks is flowing the speakers is loud yeah. but what I learned from a mortal technique is to inject my personality in it mm. and to speak on the issues mm-hmm. and so I feel like my 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 I it's, it's on me to keep my fan base informed but I do think that that's a good question for the average rapper who's not rapping about what I'm rapping about right. like a 2 chains, who's a very intelligent brother yeah. but he's not rapping about conscious shit right? right so obviously he says nigga a lot obviously there's white fans if you're a rapper and you're selling millions of records 90% of your fan base is white mm-hmm. that's just because we don't have a disposable income like that mm-hmm. you know so yeah that's that's a good question what do you uh, did you sorry go on no I just I, the only, only thing I got to add to it is I take the personal responsibility to try to make music that informs my fans so they know better okay you know, but not every rapper does that right we and that's to... what I was just gonna say because uh, obviously when you're listening to rap songs sometimes it can be uncomfortable if you're in a white club because you're not even able to enjoy the music you're just like looking around like you better not fucking say it <laughs> right I'm, you right. better right. not fucking say it yeah but like uh, Trevor Noah was saying that you know you guys should just take the n-word out of your songs, period. And um, when I do Trevor, no one don't got the right to talk about that. Okay, well, there's your answer. <laughs> I, I'm I love Trevor. I love Trevor. A, nigga, please. A, please. <laughs> but no, because it's the same thing with comedy. When you're on stage, if it's a white crowd, I'm not going to get up there and be saying nigga because if they're quoting a joke, I don't want them to say, oh, she said nigga. I mean, poor Mooney 
Didn't he stop saying nigga? I bet, yeah. Yeah, Paul Mooney said nigga for his whole career. Yeah. And then stop. Chris Tucker, too, right? Then Chris Tucker, Chris Tucker stopped saying nigga. Chris Tucker called me a nigga in San Tropez <laughs> this summer. <laughs> <laughs> on stage, <laughs> though, on stage. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that... Um, no, yeah. I think he did, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. But, I mean, I'm just saying, because it's, it's saying, like, control, like, you need to control it so that, you know, you can't complain about it if you're not saying it. But if it's a word that, you know, we want to say, like, what, that's what I was asking. Why do you think? I, 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 my it? thing is, I am optimistic about what my audience is able to handle. I, I, I try to cultivate an intersectionality minded audience that understands that, you know what, you can hear a woman call it, calling each other bitch or slut, but that's not for you to say. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, I try to I, I just try to, you know, I try to have an audience that's that's not politically correct mm -hmm. because, you know, but I try to have an audience that's informed enough to just be, you know, culturally correct. Right. You know what I'm saying? Intersectionality. Yeah. Okay. Inter the idea that marginalized people intersect at some places, mm -hmm. right? So as a black man, it makes sense for me to stand up for gay people. It makes sense for me mm -hmm. to stand up for immigrants. It makes sense for me mm -hmm. to stand up for women, even though as a straight black man born in America, that's not my experience right. because they are marginalized. Just strategy wise, just strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. But on a moral level, you know, the idea that we all suffer from the same things, like like yeah. whether you want to call it white supremacy, you want to what, what do you, you want to call it like um you know class issues. We all white supremacy is interwoven with class issues. The mm -hmm. top one percent is ninety six percent white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the people try to separate that. You know, even you know politicians. You got politicians who I like. I like someone like Bernie Sanders. I like a lot of things he says, but one thing he says that I don't like is that he tries to move away from identity politics and tries to frame everything in a class way. Mm. And I feel like his white privilege is blinding him to that. Okay. So intersectionality, I gotta, I gotta recognize identity politics, even if I don't understand somebody. Mm -hmm. Like I might look at at someone in a LGBT community or a trans person, not understand their lifestyle, but I gotta support and accept them right. and be intersection intersectional because we fight in the same fight. Agreed. You know. Um, uh, another hot bu button button topic that y'all dealt with was corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I led a discussion on Twitter that lasted for months because I am anti corporal punishment. Same. I don't believe in whooping your kids, spanking your kids. Really? Um, yeah, it's never been. I, did but you get your ass beat? I did as a not. Kid? He I did, did not. <laughs> so that's okay. That's Love I got to mention that. Okay. And when we talk about privilege, that's a. Pri I'm, I'm speaking from a privileged point of view. Mm -hmm. I did once. My grandmother did. Mm -hmm. You know which. I fucked up bad. Right. I lost some presents that she bought for my mother. What? But my okay. mother got mad at my grandmother for doing for that mm -hmm. because she was like, we don't do that. Right? It's a it's a hot button topic. Now, on the show, the show takes a position, and I, I'm assuming Kenya takes a position, takes an anti-corporal punishment position. Do you always agree with the positions that the show takes? For the most part, yes. Because mm -hmm. cause a, a, a lot of it comes from all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, uh, what word am I looking for? Uh, um, I, I can't. I can't think of it right now. The the the, the whiskey is getting to me. Yeah, but same okay. with me, brother. Let, we let, right there. But let me ask, let me let me let me, ask, <laughs> let me ask you this question: mm -hmm. Why is it that your parents mm -hmm. spared the rod with you? I think my parents approach it from a very sort of heady academic. Thing. When you mm -hmm. look at the data and you look at the numbers, spanking kids is not keeping them out of trouble. Mm -hmm. We like to feel that emotionally, mm -hmm. and people will testify to that. Right. People will say, "Y'all did, y'all did a bit on that in the episode." Mm -hmm. It was like, "We spank him, he's gonna be homeless. If we don't spank him, he's gonna be homeless." Right. So people have these anecdotal experiences, mm -hmm. like, "Man, if my mother didn't whip my ass, I would not be the man I am today." Mm -hmm. And how can you tell someone that their experience is incorrect? Mm -hmm. So what we have to do in that situation is look at the numbers. Um, the idea, I, the point that y'all made on the show, the point that your character arrived at is essentially my my belief and I feel like it's my parents' belief is that I'm trying to teach my child that I love him by putting hands on him. Right. You know, people learn from their parents and people are, we're, are violence is a cycle. Mm -hmm. You put your hands on somebody as a way to solve a problem. That's what they do. They gonna think it's okay mm -hmm. to put their hands on somebody to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I like to say I'm anti-violence but I'm pro-karma. 
Okay. Sometimes some shit you do is going to be some consequences for, mm-hmm. and you're going to have to get punched in the face. Right. Sometimes you're going to have to punch somebody in the face to defend yourself. Mm-hmm. So I'm not like, I'm not like ha- hands off. I'm not going to stand there and not defend myself. Right. But I'm trying to move. I feel like as a civilization, we have to move away from violence as a solution. And I think it starts in the home. Okay. And um, I like, I, I really like what y'all did with the show. Mm-hmm. I feel like the show made my point for me and put all the points on the table right. but arrived at what I agree with. Yeah. You know? I I agree with you on that. Um, Were you beat as a child? Oh, was I? <laughs> Same. Uh, I was tied butt naked to an avocado tree and whipped with the fan belt off an 84 Ford carrier truck. Y'all had wow. an avocado tree though? Like, Two avocado trees. <laughs> California Fancy? shit. Fancy? Yeah. In, in Compton. Right, no, that's some, that's that's some, that's some hood yeah. shit. My mother... Uh, remember back in the day they came up with a, a 976 uh, child abuse hotline number mm-hmm. my mother was about to whoop my ass one day and I said my mother was a telephone operator for the county of Los Angeles mm-hmm. and oh, I was gosh. like so this hotline number came up and mm-hmm. she was about to whoop my ass and I was like I'm gonna call child abuse hotline <laughs> and my mother went to the phone and dialed the number you're damn right. right my mom did the same thing and gave me the receiver and she stood there with the extension cord wrapped around her hand and the lady picked up the phone and said, Child abuse hotline, how may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, child abuse hotline, how may I help you? And all you hear in the background is my mama. Tell her! <laughs> <laughs> Hello, child abuse hotline, how may I help you? Tell the bitch I'm about to beat your ass! <laughs> Tell her! Black mamas. Now, that's, uh, that's fucking, that's what's crazy about that is that that's the other part of the, the conversation why it gets emotional. Yeah. The reason why my conversation on Twitter lasted two months is because people have a feel away about this because you're asking people to criticize their parents mm-hmm. and things that their parents did out of, out of love, out right? Out of love, yes. Out of, out of survival. In our, in our communities, a lot of the parents felt like, I have to teach tough love in order to for my kid to survive that and that's all they knew that's all mm-hmm. they knew right? they didn't know an alternative mm-hmm. they didn't know your parents right alternative. which is why it's a privilege yeah yeah but see, it's crazy though because uh my mom whooped our ass but we also had to like write an essay we had to write essays if why we... you was getting your ass beat right. no but it's oh, like okay. your mom is a libra huh she believe in balance. my mom's a virgo <laughs> so she like we had to like if we did something wrong she would give us a book report that we have to write my cousin got caught stealing. that's my mom did the book we report. had to do uh-huh. an essay about the um the pressure of, of peer pressure and why you shouldn't mm. steal it, whatever. But it's like, I think that you should whoop your kids, but I don't think you should slave beat your kids. I think that it should be a happy medium. Um, I read on Twitter that someone said that, uh, slave when you beat, beat your, your kids? my mom, slave wait, 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 beat wait, wait, me. my mom, slave beat me. Sometimes give I me an example of slave. Beat. <laughs> okay. A slave beat. Cause I just when, gave you an example, butt naked, tied right. to an avocado oh, tree listen. with a fan belt right. off an 84 Ford courier truck. <laughs> okay. So let me I, hear your explanation of slave beat. Slave. Uh, shit. I, I've had so many, but my last one was when I lied about having my report card and I ended up on the stairs, uh, felt like my legs were decapitated and my mom's telling me to get up and I'm like, I can't. Can't move, and then the whole house is just sitting there laughing. No, that, explain to me how you <laughs> felt your legs were decapitated. If your mom keeps whooping you and whooping you and whooping, whooping you, whooping you with what? Oh, she had this gold belt that she whooped us so much that it broke in half, and it was jeweled on one side and leather on the other side. Oh, that's nothing. That's so, not a slave. Beat. Well, I'm not from the. I'm not you want me to explain country. to you what a slave beat is? Go ahead. Being butt naked. <laughs> tied to had, no, tree. no, no, no. It's no. a different one. Being butt naked, having your wrist tied to, to together. Oh, that's then the having beat. your tied wrist tied to your brother's butt naked tied wrist. I'm sorry, with a rope thrown above the bed, hoisted up like your slaves Shut on the Amistad. Up. And then your mother leaves the room for 10 to 15 minutes to let you think about the ass whooping you're about to get. Your mother and sound like she work at the torture museum. Oh, my the, God. She's into... <laughs> mama, I, I love no you. I didn't mean to mama. tell these stories, mama. <laughs> I tell these stories, my mama gets emotional. It's the like, whiskey. What the fuck, I didn't. Yes, <laughs> she, she did, so mama. You did. Yes, they like she to did. say you lie. It's like, yes, no, she you did, were mama. there. But, but hold on, mm-hmm. mama. Your ass whooping's made me the man that I am And that's what they say. And that's what they say. But that was a little too much. Word that was up. definitely a slave beat. I do like, before we move on, I do like, because I really do like that episode, man, because it, it, mm. it, it captured what I think. Um, I do like the whole, like, Miles being, dis- you being disappointed. That, yeah. I feel like, is more, it's very powerful. The idea that your your kids look up to you. Yeah. And if you can con- convey to them mm-hmm. that you're disappointed, that's more powerful than any being. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. No, you know what? The most powerful thing my dad ever did to to me while I thought I was going to get my ass beat was not whoop my ass. Mm. And he said the exact words uh, that you just said. I came home expecting to get my ass beat. 
And my dad rolled over and looked at me and said, you disappointed your mother. Mm. And that shit. And he rolled right back over. And that's it. And that shit hurt me worse mm-hmm. than any ass whooping I've ever received in my life. That's right. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I yeah. was cutting school. I was cutting a lot of school. Mm-hmm. My father, my father, this is, this is what we talk about. My father was like, listen, this is real shit. Perry Green, he was like, I don't believe in hitting my kids. He said, but you're 14 years old and you're too big for me to spank you. Mm. So I don't, I'm at Whitsand. I don't know what to do. The next time you cut school, we're going to go in the garage and we're just going to have to fight. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. But my father is someone who doesn't believe in violence. Right. So this is something that, you know, I'm like, right. he was at his wit's end. Right. My mother was crying. Oh, man. When mm-hmm. he's, and I was, I never, to, as I'm thinking about it, just seeing my mother cry. I never saw my mother cry before. It's the first right. time I ever saw my mother. You know, it's like. So you had white I, parents pretty much. No, they were not white. See, there you go with the stereotypical. <laughs> you just push back against that Just because that his parents were educated <laughs> doesn't mean they were white. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she cried and she was like, I, I, that, that fucked me up. Like, mm-hmm. see, I was, I, I made my mother cry. Right. It was worse than she, I don't, I can't compare it because they ain't hit me. Mm-hmm. But it was worse than when my grandmother hit me, I guess. So that you've never been hit, me. spanked by your parents, no, ever? No, never, not. Your grand, big mama was the only one. That's right. We went to Macy's to buy, every year she would buy Christmas presents for my parents for us to give to our parents. Right. And we took the train and I left the present on the train. <sighs> and my grandmother was not a rich woman. Right. You know what I'm saying? So she would save up her check so that she yeah. could. And she was like, you did what? And she beat my ass on that platform. You deserve wow. it. And you know what? I probably did deserve, did deserve that deserve one. It. But I, you know why I needed that one? So that I could speak on it with just a little bit of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you don't have FOMO. <laughs> right, right. I had FOMO. That's what it is. Um, man, um, another episode. Um, I, I could talk about Blackish all fucking day. Mm-hmm. But um, Lemons. Yeah. The Trump episode. Yeah. Um. As a Nina Simone is like my spiritual musical godmother. Okay. And I could tell y'all hip hop heads by the way you had blood on the leaves and then the yeah. Nina's version of Strange Fruit. Yeah. And it was placed right. That speech, I know that went viral. It became that that's like a staple of the show, the speech you made. Mm-hmm. And the way that you made it, those conversations with Wanda Sykes and everybody. And shout out to Alan Maldonado, who was my homie. Yeah. He's a guest on the show. Shout yeah. out to Dean Cole. And I'm sorry, I don't know the names of the white people who are on Blackish. Yeah. Uh, you know Jeff Meacham and Peter McKenzie. Jeff Meacham, right. And Peter McKenzie. Yeah. Like everybody is, you know, it's like that shit was so powerful, mm-hmm. beautiful excellent so necessary yeah yara's participation in that man the, the writing it came together and then um ta-nehisi um am i saying his name right because now i sound like junior <laughs> uh, ta-nehisi ta-nehisi me and him born the same year okay our parents know each other um i when i read he wrote a book called beautiful struggle it's named yes. after my album beautiful struggle okay you know what i'm saying um i was in ferguson Mm. I argued with Don Lemon live on the air. Mm-hmm. Y'all had Don Lemon in the episode. Yeah. I was watching a little jealous, like, what the fuck? I can't be in the... <laughs> Y'all should have had me reenacting that. But um, was there any real pushback? You're, you're on ABC, Disney. Right. Was, this is, you you mentioning Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland yeah. and dealing with and, and Freddie Gray and that scene when y'all... um. You had this fictional character, fictional situation that happened, mm-hmm. but you tied it into everything. And I yeah. see where everyone's like, no, that's the one. No, that's the one. That's a real experience for yeah. us. Like, was there pushback to that? You know what? Not not to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't I don't know what the the fight uh is always is behind the scenes mm-hmm. in, in in terms of the network and and the pushback that we may get. But but mm-hmm. I can I can uh, that, that Kenya had to fight. Mm-hmm. Um but I can say this. In the beginning, when we started our show, and I always believe this to be the case to this day, uh, I was brought into uh, the office of the president of uh, entertainment for ABC when we sold our show. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, Anthony, make the show that you want to make. And I'll worry about the rest. Mm -hmm. Um, That was from Paul Lee. And that is how we've always operated. Mm -hmm. Um, now there may have been, there, there has been some pushback, uh, on, on, on certain things, but not a lot. Um, but for the most part, uh, we've been able to make the show that we want to make. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but hopefully you have Kenya on the show one day and you know, he yeah, can talk, I'd love to. He, he can talk about, you to plug, you know, plug yeah, me in. I got you, <laughs> I got you. And he, and he can talk about it, uh, with, with, with better detail mm-hmm. in, in terms of, um, uh, the pushback that's in because you know he protects me mm-hmm. and and protects the show, 
uh, and, and all of that. So those fights, unless it's a big fight and, and there's never been a big fight but with the exception of one. Which yeah. is what? I'll let Kenya tell you that. Okay, when he comes on the show, <laughs> yeah, I'll let Kenya tell you now that. Now we're going to definitely have yeah. Kenya. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Kenya tell you that. <laughs> Let's get him. Um, but yeah, even even with the N-Word episode, Paul Lee was like, yo, make your show. Mm-hmm. I'll fight this fight because we had to go through standards and practices. Right. like, yo, I'll, I'll fight this fight for you. Right. you. You go say it as many times as you want. Right. You know, I'll right. fight this. Right, no doubt. Um, so that's the support that we've always had from from ABC. Okay, the blackest blackish episode mm-hmm. is probably the Prince one. Okay, because Prince, you know, what he represents to music even blacker than Juneteenth. Oh, that was a black no, one. Yeah, that was a black. <laughs> that, was, that was a good one. Yeah, but let's talk about the Prince episode because beyond yeah. it just being an episode on a show. Uh, you you were friends with Prince. Mm-hmm. Um, I was friendly with Prince as well. We've mm-hmm. had some similar experiences. Yeah. at the Prince Estate. Yes, you know, you got any good Prince stories to share for us? Oh man, uh, I, I'll say this before I get into my story. Yara Shahidi, mm. uh, her father was Prince's personal photographer for okay. like twenty plus years. Okay, so so it was it was a, it was a, a familiar thing uh, for us. Uh, yeah, man, I was I was leaving Prince's house one day. Uh, here in LA Mm -hmm. from a party and Prince came out of a back room and stopped me at the elevator at his crib and was like Anthony (laughs) (laughs) I've been hearing some strange things about my brothers and sisters here in Hollywood is everything okay (laughs) I was like yeah Prince everything cool he was like good (laughs) (laughs) I'd like to call you Anthony can I have your number I was like yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then something happened in the background. He turned and said, I'll be right back. So he goes into this back room, goes behind the door. My wife is standing at the front door and she's like, baby, come on. It's like four o'clock in the morning. Uh-huh. She's like, baby, yeah. come on. I say, babe, <laughs> Prince just asked me for my telephone. Right, 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 right. Right, right, right. right, 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 right. <laughs> so I stood there for about a good five, six minutes, yeah. man. And then an assistant came out and was like, um, yeah, Prince is handling something in the back. Um, but he told me to get your information because he wants to get in, stay in contact with you. I'm like, wow. yeah, I gave him my mama number, my number, my email number, <laughs> right. my address, my social security, all, all kinds <laughs> the of stuff. Backups. And uh, from that day on, Prince, if Prince, he rarely spoke to me on the phone. I did speak to him on the phone once, but Prince would always have somebody call me to make sure I was made aware and that I always had an invite to anything that he mm-hmm. was wow. doing. And since he's a Jehovah Witness, um, they don't celebrate Christmas or birthdays mm-hmm. or anything like that. And I remember one time, but I wasn't even cognizant of that. I was just like, yo, Prince, it's my wife's birthday, man. Mm-hmm. Can can you say happy birthday one day? I called I called him one day. Right. And he was like, Anthony, you know, <laughs> you know I don't I don't I don't celebrate things. That's like not that. what we do. Yeah. He's like, but I will talk to your wife. Yes. Right. And I put him on the phone with my wife one day. Right. And and um that shit was just dope, man. And, you know, to get a call from his assistant, it was like, mm-hmm. yo, Prince says you haven't been to the Vegas show. Mm-hmm. The show's closing in a couple of weeks. At the club, he opened up that club for yeah, a year. Club, yeah, yeah I, went, I went to that show. Yeah, he was like, when yeah. can we expect you? Wow. I was like, you can expect me this weekend. 1812, what was it called? It was a number? Uh, no, 3121. 3121, right. Yeah, so I, I would I, I, I mob down there with with about 10 people to go to a show to celebrate with him, man. He called me up on stage. He would call wow. me. He would find out that, I, I don't know how how he would know I would be in the building, but mm-hmm. it's not just me, but, you know, mm-hmm. there's people. We were in Madison Square Garden one day when I was living in New York doing mm-hmm. Law and Order. I'm, I'm at the concert. This person security comes to me and was like, hey, uh, Prince wants you to come right. on stage. I'm like, I don't even know I'm here. <laughs> That's beautiful, man. You know, and I get on stage and it's me, Jamie Foxx, Whoopi Goldberg. Right. It's just all kinds of crazy people yeah. on there. I'm like, yo. I went to that show in Vegas and um, he used to like to freestyle rap. Okay. And he was performing and I'm sitting at the table and I had tables. Yes. He jumped on the table. Uh huh. And he's rapping at me, <laughs> right? Freestyling. And then he gives me the mic. Yeah. And the band is playing uh, Brick House. Okay. Uh, Commodores. Yeah. It's me, Dave Chappelle, and Ludacris. Okay. And he's like, "Come on stage." So I'm freestyling on the mic, and I walk on the stage, and um, I pass the mic to Luda, 
Luda freestyles, and he I passed he passed the mic to me, and the band is going into the hook, uh-huh. and so I sang the hook. Yeah, I was like, "She's a brick." Yeah, ow, you know what I'm saying? I just went into it, and I'm like, "Yo, I'm up here singing the Commodores." Right. But Prince, I had to call my mama after yeah. the show. Yeah, yeah, no, that's dope. It's crazy when you fanboy out over someone. Oh, oh yeah. no, it's, it's 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 wild. Same same uh, uh thing in Vegas. Mm-hmm. For some reason, Prince could not remember my name. <laughs> So he's on stage and he's jamming and I was like, somebody bring the actor. <laughs> bring the actor on stage. <laughs> somebody get the actor. <laughs> actor, come on stage. Yeah. <laughs> and my family, everybody was like, yo, aunt. Uh, and I'm the only actor. Right, you the actor. And they were like, yo, aunt, I think, I think he, uh, I think actor. he wants you. He, he ain't said, somebody get the actor. Right. <laughs> and I go on stage, man. And, and, and we ended up on stage, me, Macy Gray. Whoa. Uh, it, it was just crazy. And then Prince leaves the stage. And so we're just up there jamming, literally, for 10 minutes with the band. Right. Prince just goes and does a, a wardrobe Genius. change. <laughs> but we the same, same outfit. Yes. Wardrobe change, the same outfit, different Less color. Di- yes. Okay. Different, different color. color. Yes. He would show up in the white and then change to the black. Did, and then he comes back on, then Usher does all had to tell me, he's, like, he's coming back in. So we leave. And I was like, yo, this shit is crazy. Right. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I still have a hotel key from the Madison Square uh, Garden show. Uh, we went to the Village Underground after the oh, show. Oh, man. Prince. The jam sessions. Yeah. yeah. Prince, myself, my wife, uh, Prince's assistant. So we're sitting on the bankhead in there. And the only person between me and Prince is his assistant. Mm-hmm. And he leans over to his assistant, says something. His assistant leans over to me and says, Anthony, uh, Prince wants you to come back to the hotel room for pasta and pizza. <laughs> but Prince is literally sitting right there. Right, 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 right. He leans over to her, and I was like, okay, well, tell him we'll come. And, she goes in. and then so everybody thinks Prince is going to jam mm-hmm. because that's what he normally does. Mm-hmm. And so he doesn't perform that night after the show. So Prince leaves around three. And so she leans over and is like, okay, we're about to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, we're at the Ritz Carlton. Prince will be expecting you. I was like, all right, cool. Prince <laughs> this ain't, gets up and leaves. I say, hey, babe, let's roll. So we get in the car, we get in the cab, go to uh, the Ritz Carlton, mm-hmm. Central Park West, uh, South. And uh, there's a dude standing at, uh, at the elevator as I walk in. He's like, Mr. Anderson, uh, room, whatever, gives me a key and pushes the elevator button, and we go up to the door. I got a key to Prince's wow. hotel suite. Mm-hmm. And I, Put it in, boom, open up, magic is happening. Just people just all over the yeah. place. And I walk to a back room and it's uh Tavis Smiley, Dr. Cornell West, and Prince fucking just huddled up in yep. a corner, just yep. rapping. That's and right. I walk in, they all look up and he's like, What's up, man? I was like, What's up? Right. <laughs> right, I, right, right. I felt like I was interrupting some shit. So I fall back and I go back and it's just a who's who wow. in, mm-hmm. in 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 the hotel it's room. That's how it was. And then yeah. all of a sudden at about four o'clock. Pasta and pizza just arrived. <laughs> and we eat pasta and pizza, right. all of us. And then I took some fruit. I took the hotel key and I was stealing shit. And I just took it. <laughs> and I still have this shit in my office at the crib right now. Right. You still know? from yeah. Compton. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, baby. Yeah. The Ritz Carlton is just yeah. like Compton. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anthony Anderson is a wonderful guest. I have one more question I have to ask. I got to ask this because you went to Howard. Yes. Uh, Steve went to Howard. And, um, you know, I didn't go to HBCU, but I understand, you know, Jamel Hill made some comments fairly recently about athletes. She felt like athletes, black athletes should try to go to HBCUs. Okay. And I, and when I look at the, um, the numbers, black lawyers, black doctors, black professionals, whatever, mm-hmm. a lot of them come from these HBCUs. Yes. Mm-hmm. How important are the HBCUs? Very important. Uh, Howard, Uni- uh, Howard University produces more black lo- uh, lawyers and doctors than any other university out there. You know, this whole sports they thing. They just, Howard University debate team just beat the Harvard they debate. They just beat the Harvard debate Shout team. out to them for that. Shout, yeah, shout out to right. And them niggas the was up team. there like, <laughs> yo, nigga <laughs> Yeah, yeah, la, 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 la. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but no, it, it's, it's very important. It, imagine if athletically mm-hmm. if all of this black talent decided mm-hmm. not to go to the dukes mm-hmm. and the north carolinas mm-hmm. and all of this and came to or the kentuckys and came to howard mm-hmm. or the alabamas and all and mm-hmm. all of that and, and, and fam and, and came and, and well, not just howard but went to these hbcus mm-hmm. 
what that would mean for those universities mm-hmm. financially, mm-hmm. what that would mean and how that would attract other athletes to come in here mm-hmm. uh, to these universities so they could thrive. Uh, I, I, I just I just think culturally that that's that's what uh, we should be doing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't I don't know what it is. How can we how we can attract them? You know, th- there, there's a prospect, uh, a young brother, uh, basketball player right now. I forget who he is. You know, he's considering and he's supposed to go number one mm-hmm. in the country. Uh, and he's considering going to an HBCU. Yes. That's a new level yeah. of woke. If that's what they call it still. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, 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 I think it's a, uh, I think it's a beautiful thing, man, mm-hmm. you, that, that we should do. That's we right. dominate sports. If we go to our schools, no one would beat us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, we got to be uh, strategic and tactical sometimes. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party welcomes Anthony Andrews. Here, here. Cheers, bro. We got through it. it. <laughs>